Sean Lane here. Today is October 11, 2020. Make sure to check us out on fightly.com and you are watching the Fightly Report and we are live at MJ, MBJ Studios in Lombard. Everybody welcome again and things are heating up in the month of October when we talk about mixed martial arts. We've got Bellator 249 on tap, Cyborg versus Blanco. We're going to do a preview for that. We're going to go over the results of UFC Fight Night, Marias versus Sanhagen on UFC on ESPN Plus this past Saturday. Also, the results of Bellator 248 in Paris, France. MMA News headlines. LFA 92 uh, had a big interview with uh, Chicago area bantamweight Askar Askar. I did an interview of him, so we'll review his last fight, a big win over Kevin Ruth at LFA 92. LFA 93, uh, preview of Aaron Jeffrey and Sam Hughes, who are fighting on the card, who I also have interviews with. And a UFC fight night, Ortega versus the Korean Zombie uh, predictions. So we got a lot to cover. Let's get right into it. And I'm excited to talk about UFC fight night, Vegas. We actually, UFC uh, on Fight Island last night. Of course, uh, we looked at the main event, Corey Sanhagen versus Marlon Moraes. Uh, I did pick Moraes, but very hesitantly I did. Uh, did, did so, you know, because I said both these guys are dangerous. The way Corey Sanhagen would win this fight, in my mind, that played out was that he would take him down and submit him. Sanhagen has multiple submission victories in the uh, UFC, you know, lean up to his uh, loss to Aljamain Sterling. He is deadly on the ground. Uh, Marais is also well, well versed on the ground. What I didn't see is what we saw Sanhagen in the first, in the second round, a minute and three seconds, with a huge TKO finish. Uh, big head kick and strikes. And this fight could be seen as the next number one contender for the Bantamweight title. We know that Peter Yan is the current 135-pound champion. Next up for him is pr pretty much, we could say, Aljamain Sterling, except that fight hasn't been made official. But the guy that Sterling just finished in his last fight, Sanhagen just finished the former challenger and Marlon Moraes. I think Sanhagen moves up to get uh, to challenge. I think he could be possible replacement if something were to happen and, and an opponent would drop out between Peter Yan and Aljamain Sterling. If someone dropped out, he could, you could put him right in there, either for interim shot against Aljamain Sterling, a rematch, or take, he would take on the champion. And I think he's ready. I think he showed he was ready. I knew the Aljamain Sterling fight was just a lesson that was going to be learned, but he was going to overcome it. It wasn't going to be detrimental to his career, as some people, as, as some other fighters' careers would be. And he came right back into it. Elevation Fight Team is one of the hottest gyms in MMA right now. You know, I've done quite a few interviews with their fighters. And all I can say is Corey Sanhagen getting back on that win streak, even though he lost, his, you know, he lost on his way to getting to the top. He is back on top, and I feel like he is next in line. You know, whether it be Peter Yan, whether it be Aljamain Sterling, whoever is next, you have got a beast in to contend with if Corey Sanhagen. I feel like this is the fight he really has arrived. And, you know, I mean, just look at his record, 13-2. and two. And Aljamain Sterling is only his second loss in his career. And be before that, you know, the win streak he was on was incredible. You know, so a five-fight win streak in the UFC. Overall, it was a seven-fight win streak he was on until he lost to Sterling. And then Marias was a tough guy, and he won with that wheel kick, a beautiful wheel kick. You know, it caught him right on the temple of the head and followed up with some punches, and that was it. And, and Mom Marais, you could tell he was out of it. And we, we also learned, we also learned after the fight that he suffered a broken orbital bone, did Marlon Marais, from the head kick as well. Even though he would look like he could have, um, if you watch it, you know, right away, you know, instantaneously you think, oh, wow, he could have uh, survived. They should have let him, you know, they should have not called a knockout. It was premature. But when you learn that information and just the damage that uh, Sanhagen did, it, it's incredible, you know. And a guy that came off, you know, big submission victories. You know, he's had some TKO victories as well. But a guy that went to two decisions, he's really putting in the work. He is really uh, showing that he's really separating himself from the rest of the uh Stacked 135 pounders, and I think that he's next in line for the belt after Aljamain Sterling takes on Peter Yan, which is still yet to be announced. We'll find out probably in 2021 if that's going to happen. But I'm excited to see, you know, basically, you know, what Corey Sanhagen does from here. You know, I think that that the title fight makes sense. 
uh, the title shot, if he's going to wait, if he's gonna, not going to wait, who he's going to fight after that, we'll see. But I think it, it definitely makes sense for him to slot in as a number one contender, awaiting the winner of Aljamain Sterling against the champion, Peter Jan. And these are toughest guys. I think this is uh, the most fun that the 135-pound weight class has been the past couple years. And even though Henry Cejudo did uh, retire, which I think he's taking a break, to be honest with you. I think when the money is right, he'll come back. And we don't know. Maybe maybe he'll go to Bellator. Maybe he'll go to another promotion overseas. Maybe he'll follow Demetrius Johnson. Okay, I know I'm getting off track, but maybe he'll follow Demetrius Johnson and get that rematch with Demetrius Johnson at 1FC. So, I mean, that possibilities are endless, but in terms of UFC, I think their division has never been more stacked as it has been now and it has had as much attention as it has been now. And I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes from here. Next, next fight, of course, we're going to talk about, as I go through my notes, we had a fun fight between Duricus Duplessis and Marcus Perez, and that was a straight-up first-round knockout. So we're just going over the big finishes here, and that was a brutal knockout. You know, obviously, uh, Perez tried to play mind games to Duplessis. He came out with a Joker makeup, if you guys saw that. It looked really freaky. He had the long hair and everything. Uh, tried to get in his head. Duplessis, though, this is his uh, UFC debut and very successful one. Uh, debut on a three-fight win streak. Now all are finishes. So this guy is really bringing attention to the UFC, right? And not only bringing attention to UFC, he's bringing attention to where he comes from. He's one of the, now one of the few South African fighters in the UFC. So bringing attention to the region that he comes from. And it was just some clean shots there that landed. And Perez is a veteran. You didn't know how Duplessis would hold up. And this fight, although it was kind of a shorter notice, he was getting ready to debut for another MMA promotion. So it's like he was already training. You know, it's not, it didn't take away from him. So I feel like that was a lot of... Uh, confidence built for this youngster and he is going to be definitely someone to reckon with uh, moving forward I feel like not only that he's just a guy that we look at and watch in the middleweight division he's going to be exciting you know we're going to see a lot more international talent moving forward and this is just the, the scratching the surface of that and I think that's what UFC Fight Island is going to bring I think that's what's going to happen when the, you, the borders open up again and we have UFC back in the states we're going to see an incredible wealth of talent. And, you know, UFC should also think about going to Africa and, and hosting an event there. I'm sure they've already thought about it, right? They want to, they want to conquer the world, right? They were the first in Russia. They were the first in China. I'm sure they want to go to Africa. So, I'm, obviously, when you have a guy like Duplessis, that's going to be great for marketing, you know, when you got a, a local fighter like that. So, I'm excited to see what, where they move from here. Uh, next fight, of course, is Marcin Tibera against Big Ben Rothwell. And Tibera won the unanimous decision, 29-27, all three judges. Um, this fight was different because, you know, if you look at what I had said last week, I anticipated that Tibera would stand, keep the fight staying with Rothwell. I, I, I didn't see that happening. I anticipated it was going to be a ground fight. Like, I, I, Tibera was going to take him down, use that grappling, and really try to get that TKO finish. Um, I believe I thought uh, Ty Burr was going to finish him. Instead, it was a decision, but Ty Burr stood with Ben Rothwell. He took Ben Rothwell's punches, but, man, he fired back. Outstruck him 155 to 95. That was a lopsided, you know, uh, when you look at the stats. Uh, Rothwell was on a two-fight win streak until he lost this. It's a bloody fight. And now Ty Burr is on a three-fight win streak. And I go back to what I said last week. If, if Ty Burr wins this fight... I think he fights Curtis Blades next. I think that, that fight makes sense, you know. I think that, you know, Curtis Blades needs to prove that he's still relevant in the division. Uh, Ty Burr's got good wrestling. I'm not I'm not sure it's on the level of Curtis Blades. We see he can strike well. I, I think that, that that's the next fight for Curtis. And, um, you know, obviously he's waiting in the wings to see what happens with Francis Ngannou. But you also got John Jones who's inserted himself in the heavyweight division. So... You know what I mean? And Jones is oh, Jones already wants to get a title shot just walking in. And maybe, maybe people, including myself, don't think that's the right way. And Dana White said it. And Ganu has done enough to stay in that division and, and, and become and, and get a title shot. You know, you can't just can't have John Jones leapfrog him just because he's coming up from light heavyweight to heavyweight. But obviously, we'll see what happens as, as, as that time goes on. Obviously, Steve Miocic, we probably won't see him in... 2020 probably we'll see him in 2021 against Francis Ngannou 
who is on a three fight win streak, who has finished guys like Cain Velasquez, Junior Dos Santos, Alistair Overeem. You know, how can you not argue that Francis Ngano is number one contender at this point when they're all big finishes? So I think. And God was next, and also, you know, he defeated Kurt, uh, he defeated uh, Derek Lewis. So I think that Engano is number one for this for this division. After that, we'll see who is the clear cut number one contender. But Tybura has definitely made a case uh, to to move up that rankings. The next fight, of course, was Tom Aspinall defeats Allen uh, bowed out by uh, TKO. That was a Big first round finish. Uh, Aspinall with a big first round. This is his second knockout in the UFC. So this was his only second fight in a minute and 35 seconds. He's now 5-0. and uh, Looked good doing it. I think he wanted, he was ready to keep fighting. <laughs> There's a guy that's hungry to keep going and didn't have enough. So he might have a quick turnaround after this one. But yeah, Tom Aspinall looking very good at 5-0. and and that's what we're looking for. And when we talk about heavyweights and we talk about the divisions, is that you know we, we have we have guys like this ready and hungry to go. And so, you know, Marcin Tybura, you know, obviously he's now twenty and six. He's obviously going to climb those rankings. And then Tom Aspinall, in his second fight in the UFC, defeats Alan Badot by <clears throat> a big finish, ground and pound TKO. So heavyweight division is looking good. You know, I think the depth is getting better for the heavyweights. International talent is 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 imploding, and exploding is going to explode in the UFC when in that heavyweight division, and uh, I think they're building it up smartly. I mean, Bellator says they had the best light heavyweight division, but when it comes to heavyweights, I feel UFC is definitely getting stronger more and more each day. And we have another a bit of news about the heavyweight division moving forward when I go over some MMA headlines. Um, but that was a great fight, and now Tom Aspinall, again, 9-2 and two overall, 5-fight win streak in the UFC. And he is really looking to be the guy that's really going to, you know, climb up and get that big win. So, next up we have, again, I said 5, he's on a 5-fight win streak, and then he's 9-2 and two overall. Uh, next up, we saw Ilya Topuria versus Yusef Zalal. You know, unanimous decision. I had Zalal win this fight. Zalal, you know, had a four-fight win streak, and Topuria ended that. Uh, really took it to Zalal. You know, leg kicks were used very well. It was an aggressive fight. Um, you know, took him to the ground. It's a big debut for Topuria, who is undefeated, nine and zero, oh, and not really even coming from a big MMA promotion like he came from Brave CF. Uh, but not really, you know, a huge promotion. And to defeat Zalal, who is like a former LFA champion, that's a huge feather in his cap. So I felt like that was a huge win for him. And uh, moving forward, we'll see more from Tapuria. Then we get to the undercard. Tom Breeze defeated KB Bolar by TKO strikes in the first round, a minute and 42 seconds in the heavyweight division. Then we're going to get to one of the greatest... Knockouts ever on the undercard. Jokwin Buckley, of course, took on Impa Kasagane by knockout. Second round, two minutes and three seconds, and it was such an impressive finish. If you had to see it, a buck, uh, basically Kasagane caught his leg, and in midair, Jokwin Buckley kicked him with his other foot. With his other foot, and that was insane. I mean, you're gonna see this on ESPN highlight reels. I'm sure Buckley is gonna be on Ariel Hawani's list to be interviewed. Um, just a sick uh, finish, you know. It was, it just came into second round, basically. It was described as Kasayane caught Buckley's kick, and rather than pull his leg free, Buckley jumped and launched his right foot backward, connecting a clean and smooth knockout. And he was out cold. So uh, for Buckley, this is a huge, you know, boost. You know, this guy is probably going to be on the main card soon. This, you know, Dana White's going to be impressed by this. There's going to be hype around him. And that was that's what we need. So some huge knockouts, some huge f uh, finish like that. And that was about because it was his right foot backwards. Basically a backward kick in midair. He connected clean. It was a risky move because obviously if he didn't connect, he might have been in a bad position, uh, and Kasane might have uh, been able to knock him out or either take him down. So, you know, it's, it's one of those crazy risks, but that's what I think UFC is about. That's what we are about. I think that's, that's what the promotion is based on, 
and moving forward we're going to find more of these highlight reel finishes i mean the bar the level is set so high and the bar is set so high and many fighters come out there and really just demolish people and just to go over the rest of the card real quick we had tony kelly defeated ali al Kasi by unanimous decision he got his first ufc win so congrats to him he got his chick aze defeated omar morales by unanimous decision uh, Tracy Cortez defeated Stephanie Egger by unanimous decision. And Tiger Ulanbekov defeated Bruno Silva by unanimous decision. And that is UFC Fight Night Island. And we are going to go over Bellator 248 results uh, right next. So stay tuned. You're listening to the Fight Lee Report. Hey guys, this is Marisol Ruelas with Fight Athlete Report. Check out my interview at fightlee.com. All right. Well, right now we're going to go over headlines uh, for the UFC. And... You know, obviously, we got to see about Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier, tweets that were exchanged between the two. We talked about, you know, Dustin Poirier wanting to uh, contribute uh, money from the fight, proceeds from the fight to the, to the Good Fight Foundation, you know, that, that he's been doing to help out his community in Louisiana. And Conor McGregor was ready to support that. They were talking about doing the fight outside UFC. Of course, I didn't really think that was realistic. Since then, UFC has offered contracts to both Dustin and Conor McGregor to fight. And, you know, what I'm about to say next affects this because UFC 256 has lost their main event. Uh, the welterweight champion, Kamaru Usman, has postponed his fight to Gilbert Burns to early 2021. So, uh, UFC 256, which is on December 12th, and UFC 255, which I believe is on November 11th, both, have, both need a main event. Uh, UFC is eager to get him going, and Conor McGregor said if he does fight, it has to be in 2020. He must fight this year. Uh, so he's verbally agreed to it. He just needs Dustin to verbally agree to it. Uh, from but we're only taking him on his word, you know. And and you know, obviously McGregor has done, he has had some uh, transgressions with Dana White, saying he's put stuff in his mouth and this and that. And you know, we're not sure what to believe. You know, we were told that McGregor was ready to fight. Uh, five months ago when the pan, you know, during this pandemic, when it was, when the UFC was coming back during the pandemic and we're in conflicting reports. So, but it seems like that, that if Conor is ready to fight, that this is going to happen this year. And, you know, with two big pay-per-views that still don't have main events, obviously the co-main event of UFC 256 is Amanda Nunes defending her title against Megan Anderson in the featherweight division. But you know, we don't have a main event. So if Conor McGregor slots himself in there, that'd be perfect against us uh, for Dustin Poirier to get that main event. And I feel like if, if it is a main event of a pay-per-view, they do have to offer Dustin Poirier more money. But will it meet his demand? We'll see. And we'll be keeping uh, track of this story on the Fight League Podcast. I'm expecting something next week. Uh, I'm expecting an announcement that this fight's going to happen and when it will. But we'll see. It, you know, we'll see how long negotiations take. And what will happen? And now UFC 256 loses their main event. Uh, welterweight champion Kamaru Usman, as we said, postponed with Gilbert Burns to early 2021. There's a scramble, mad scramble to see who could take that event. I think Poirier McGregor is more likely to. Uh, Stephen Miocic and Francis Ngannou is possibly talks about fighting, and then I've also mentioned uh, Nate Diaz and uh, George Masvidal in the rematch. So. There's a few fights that they're looking at to, to put in that to slot. So we'll see what happens. Former UFC heavyweight Fabricio Verdum in talks with Bellator and MMA for a fight with Fedor. He says he wants Fedor. If Fedor signs on the contract, he will, he will, he will join Bellator and MMA. And that was the big heavyweight news I was teasing. Of course, Fabricio Verdum, former UFC heavyweight champion, has not you know fallen off a little bit from where he used to be. But he's still a tough guy. And listen, if he could fight Fedor, that would be a great fight because they have fought each other before. I think that uh, Wardoom is probably one of those guys that gave Fedor a run for his money. But still, Fedor was on that streak. Fedor was streaking and he was just destroying everybody, which was like last decade, right? And so Fabricio Wardoom came in and he, he submitted him. That was at Strike Force back in 2010, and that was after that glorious run that Fedor was on, and and since then, these two never had a rematch. 
This is a most talked about fight for for Redoom. I know he wants that rematch against him. For Fedor, we have to see if his interest lines up with Fedor's for this rematch. I mean, it was a first round triangle armbar, and you know, Fedor Fedor had to be embarrassed by that. And it was just a tough fight, a tough loss for him to eat. And when he was on that glorious run, and and many people thought he was overrated too about Fedor, but you know, Fedor was 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 probably one of the not not the most clean one of the cleanest submission guys like he just he caught that arm he caught that leg and that was it like he wasn't letting go for dear life <laughs> so I, I feel like that this is gonna be a fight the fans want i i think bellator is a perfect place for it to happen it's a a great rematch and you know obviously fedor is coming off i mean actually not fedor but obviously where doom is coming off a big win where Doom just beat Alexander Gustafson by first round armbar at UFC Fight Night. And I believe that was the last fight on his contract. So if this fight happens with Amir Fedor, he'll be ready to go and sign with Bellator. And Fedor, again, he wants to, does he, does Fedor, it just depends. Does Fedor want to go out like he did? Does he want to go out with being knocked out by Ryan Bader? Or does he want to come back there and revenge this loss? To Fabrizio Wear Doom because you know that was a that was like his first loss in such a long time. Basically, the the first loss before that was a doctor stoppage. It was a doctor stoppage, and that was the only blemish, and it was controversial. Like literally, it, he got caught, and they stopped the fight. But is that really a loss? I would say no. So his first true loss was Fabrizio Wear Doom back in 2010, and then after that. Subsequently, he lost two other fights to Antonio Silva and Dan Henderson, and that was the the start of that that of that horrible you know downfall for him that in his career, uh, three three losses in a row. So I, I I'm intrigued by this fight. I would I would very much like it to happen. It just depends on Fedor's interest. I know Fedor said he's wanted to fight Quill Cop before. We'll see. You know, I, I think I think where Doom is 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 the is the is the choice opponent. I think that this fight needs to happen, and and I th I understand exactly why where Doom isn't going to sign until as he fights Fedor. So, as an old school fan, like I'm excited for this fight. I want to see it happen. I want to see if Fedor has what it takes to bring to avenge that loss, or is where Doom going to finish him again, or is it going to be a, a decision? You know, it's going to be a tough contest. We'll we'll see. But I'm I'm excited for that one. That I just found out about that today, and I'm really I'm really intrigued. Uh, next next uh, bit of Bellator news is Corey Anderson makes his Bellator debut against Melvin Manhoff at Bellator 251. Make sure to check that out November 5th. And Corey Anderson comes from the UFC light heavyweight division uh, and uh, making that transition to Bellator. Hannah Gracie, uh, this is the coach of first Brazilian Jiu Jitsu coach for. Brian Ortega, he has tested positive for COVID-19. Last week he made a video and he will not corner Brian Ortega at UFC Fight Island 6. Henner has been in Brian Ortega's corner for almost all of his professional fights. And so it'll be interesting if that affects Brian Ortega when he takes on Korean Zombie. Uh, you know, obviously the UFC does rigorous testing. So before they can even enter Fight Island, they get tested in Vegas for COVID-19. And they get tested on the island so he didn't even pass the first test um obviously that's self-explanatory but uh we'll see how that affects the fight and we'll go over the results later uh predictions later so stay tuned to fight report we'll be right back